God speaks to you and he puts it on your heart. He says, I want you to make church a priority because I want you to set a legacy of faith for your family. A simple thing. And we go, yes, God, got it. Make church a priority. And then we start adding all kinds of considerations. What's the weather like this weekend? How's the parking lot going to be? Is Pastor Stephen going to be there or is it the Canadian guy again? How were the kids? Were they crazy or extra crazy? <laughs> Hello, Bezel T3. Is Pastor Stephen Furtick going to be there or is it the Canadian guy again? Well, I'm representing Canada with my Banff shirt on this morning. And the Canadian guy is Jonathan Josephs, the campus pastor of Elevation Church's multi-site mothership in Ballantyne, North Carolina. My brother, who was in Charlotte over the 4th of July weekend, 2018, was good enough, after some gentle prodding from me, to indulge me and attend the uptown multi-site location, which was near his hotel. Here are some shots he took with his phone. The venue for Uptown Elevation is the McGlohan Theater at Spirit Square in downtown Charlotte. A theater is an appropriate place because what happens at Elevation Church, by their own definition, is not a worship service, but rather a worship experience. The problem with that is, as someone once said, when the church gets into the business of staging experiences, that quickly becomes idolatry. Now this shot of this stage roving cameraman, which could be seen at any secular concert venue, is an example of just such a tendency. And this is what to expect when you visit Elevation Church for the first time. Thinking about visiting Elevation Church for the first time? Here are a few things to get you started. First, know that Jesus is the center of everything we do. From the parking volunteers to the worship team on stage, we all play a role as we come together each week to worship God. And no matter which location you choose to attend, it's the same worship experience. As soon as you arrive, let our volunteers know it's your first time by turning on your hazards. Okay, so if you're new, know that Jesus is the center of everything they do. Well, that's debatable. And it's the same carefully choreographed worship experience at every campus and turn on your hazard lights. Now, that is very prophetic and dripping with irony. So as my brother settled into the uptown venue, there was the on-site praise band, which played in sync with the mothership band, and then the focus shifted to the huge video screens and the sermon that was being broadcast from the mothership Ballantine location. Stephen Furtick, the, uh, the primary celebrity pastor, was not there this particular evening. So instead, it was the Ballantine campus pastor, Jonathan Josephs, celebrity pastor in training, who began with some transparent pastoral introspection to instill a, hey, I'm just like you kind of feeling. Moment in my life, Zach, you remember, I was real discouraged and frustrated about some areas of my life where it felt like Rather than moving towards what God had intended for my life, it felt like I was moving away from it. But then he gives a preview of just how awesome of a sermon this is going to be. If it's any indication of how much the devil was fighting me these last few weeks as I was working on this sermon, I believe that I am on assignment today to release a word from God that will catapult someone into their God-given destiny and purpose. I am fired up, ready to speak what God's put in my heart to speak with you. Now, before we get to Jonathan's sermon, I began to notice something. Now, it's no secret that Stephen Furtick has a heavy man crush on T.D. Jakes. You're so gifted. Um, there's, there's no denying that. And so I suppose it would be natural for Stephen to imitate the preaching style of his role model. Uh, this is what I mean. Somebody shout a hallelujah. Shout yes, somebody. Somebody shout it's a setup. Somebody shout free refills. And then there's this tendency for T.D. Jakes and Steven to do this clapping thing and to look genuinely angry and disgusted as they speak to the audience. And then we come to Jonathan. Now, I'm not sure if Jonathan is also copying T.D. Jakes directly or is copying Furtick, who is copying Jakes. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor! Sir, touch your neighbor say, those are big grapes. All right, enough of the T.D. Jakes slash Stephen Furtick mashup. Let's get to the sermon that my brother was forced to endure. 
watching it on the big screen at the Uptown Elevation Multi-Site Campus. The text is Numbers 13, and the sermon is entitled, Stay Focused. Now, I'll provide the setup for the three main points, and then we'll quickly take a look at them. But first, there is this odd compulsion for most megachurch pastors to want to show off their families. For our other locations and those of you joining us online, let me show you a picture of my family real quick. Here we are up on the screen. That's us serving during Love Week. Now, I'm, I'm happy that you have a great family, Jonathan, but tell me about them another time. Now, his setup is the fact that two people can look at the same situation and have two very different perspectives about it. So, of course, some humor must be injected to keep the crowd interested. We recently had this controversy around our office. It got bad. It got, it got pretty heated. And it got bad because people were like, I had coworkers losing respect for me, and they're like questioning my salvation. Like, do you even fear God, man? Now, was it his uncompromising stance on the fencing of the Lord's table? Or was it unconditional election or amillennialism? No, no. It was something far more important. The Greatest Showman was a really bad movie. It was a really bad movie. No, 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 no. It was a really bad movie. Well, he, he tried to be funny. Now next, Jonathan will craft the story of the 10 spies versus the two spies and come up with the thesis for this sermon, which is, God has great things for you, but you gotta stay focused. It's not that Joshua and Caleb were more spiritual than the others. All of these were leaders from each of the tribes. They were great men of faith. Actually, if you flip over to Numbers chapter 14, we see that Caleb was far more spiritual than the rest. Numbers 14, look at verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. You see, the different spirit that Caleb had was the Holy Spirit of God. And maybe today you are standing on the edge of something God has been trying to bring you into. It might not, not look like Canaan. It might look like peace. It might look like joy. It might look like freedom. It might look like healing. God is always trying to bring you into something. But so often we stand at the edge, never possessing what God has promised us because we lack focus. You see, this is the recipe for the mega church, folks. Create a concert-like atmosphere, provide high energy music, and have the sermon about the person sitting in the seat instead of the one who is right now seated at the right hand of God the Father, the God-man, Jesus the Christ. It's not that you don't have faith. It just might be that you don't have focus. Even great people of faith have weak moments. And I think that's what happened to these 10 spies in this passage. 40 days staring at the promise. And somewhere along the way, they lost their focus. No, they were representatives of the bulk of the Jewish people who were apostate and who refused to believe the promise of God. And God judged them for it. He says in Numbers 14, this is the Lord speaking, uh, verses 20 through 23. The Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. You see, they forgot the miracles of God and therefore began to disbelieve the promises. Now, Paul summarizes this situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. He writes, For I don't want you to be ignorant of the facts, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Oh, man. You see, interpreting the Old Testament in light of the New. So, let's get to these three points and see if Jonathan can turn this ship away from the coming collision course towards the iceberg of worldly, narcissistic preaching. And I want to look at three things today that Joshua and Caleb did so well that I think will help someone who's here today 
that God is calling you into something. This might be the message that gives you the faith, either confidence, faith in yourself, or hope, faith in God, to move forward in what he's promised. And the first thing is this, focus what you think. Did, did I just hear him say, have faith in yourself? What? Now, I read of faith in God and faith in Jesus and perseverance in the faith, but never once have I read in the Bible, have faith in yourself. All right, the first point, focus what you think. Jonathan is now going to tell us how he came to have sympathy for these 10 poor spies that simply lost their focus. I'm judging them because I'm like, I just don't understand how they could miss the promises and be so focused on the problems. And I thought about, I thought about getting up here to preach to you and be like, if you just worry about devouring those grapes, God will devour your giants or something like that. Don't tweet that, but something like that. Judging these guys, but the more I read through Numbers 13, the more I was able to get some context of what was going on in their lives, and the more I got context, the less I was judging them, and the more I was actually able to relate to them. See, context is a powerful thing because context is the key to compassion. It's real easy to make snap judgments off of snapshots when you look at someone's life. They should have done this, or they should have done that. But if you can zoom out and get some context, instead of judging them, you start having compassion on them. Look at your neighbor, say, if you knew my story. Well, speaking of context, Jonathan should have looked at the larger context of numbers. Here's what God actually thought of the 10 unbelieving spies in chapter 14. We read there, so the men Moses sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua and Caleb survived. But see, what Jonathan really wants to talk about, and he wants to make this whole sermon about, is you and your story. So, no, come on, say it. If you knew my story, if you knew my story, you wouldn't be judging me today. You'd be celebrating me today. If you knew what I had been through, if you knew what God had brought me through, how he kept me, how he saved me, you wouldn't be standing here judging me. You'd be celebrating me. You'd be thanking God for what he did in my life. Yeah, I know I got a ways to go, but by the grace of God, I'm still standing here. Man, if I close my eyes, I hear Stephen Furtick without quite as much of the hyperbolic gesticulations. When it looks like you're trapped, to know that the very Red Sea that feels like it's gonna kill you, it's gonna drown your enemies behind you. Somebody shout at you. But the second thing that I see the two spies do so well in this passage, and this is number two, focus what you hear. These 10 spies come back and they're talking about Grapes and promises at first, and then they're talking about giants and walls, but, 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 but. And the moment they start sounding like Sir Mix-a-Lot instead of men of faith talking about butts. I like big butts and I cannot lie. You other brothers can't deny. Well, sure, why not spice up the sermon with a reference to a little hip-hop focusing on the female derriere. See, there are some of us in this place today that God has put some things on your heart. There are things that God has called you to. But the reason you haven't had the confidence to move forward is because there are still voices in your life that are talking you out of what God is calling you into. Dreams he's put in your heart. Dreams he's put in your spirit. And every time you get ready to believe him and every time you get ready to take that step, there's someone in your ear saying, but, 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 but. We've now careened alongside the submerged, jagged iceberg, and this sermon is now taking on water big time. We're nowhere near Numbers chapter 13, and what's worse is that what comes next is a furtic style rant meant to whip the crowd up into a frenzy with the help of a few obvious front row rabble rousers. But, 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 but didn't the doctor tell you you wouldn't be able to conceive again? But, 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 but. Do you really want to put yourself through all that heartbreak again after what you've been through? But, 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 do you really think you're qualified for that job? 
And we let these voices talk us out of what God is calling us into because we lack focus. But you got to become selective with your hearing, man. Like my kid, it's amazing how he can hear me when he wants to hear me and doesn't hear me when he doesn't want to. You got to become selective in your hearing because your faith is a product of your focus. You got to focus what you hear. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, my faith is not determined by what I I see my faith is determined by what I hear I got to submit my life under the words that God has spoken over my life I need friends who will stand in my corner and declare what God has said over my situation God said I belong to him God said he's my I'm his child God said no weapon formed against me would prosper or prevail hallelujah thank you God did you ever read or, or see the silver chair from the Chronicles of Narnia series it's like there has to be a few silver chair moments in every Elevation Church sermon. Black dog! Burning me! Burning me! Enchantment! Enchantment! Black dog! Into the black! Black dog! Mercy! Mercy! Have mercy! All right, let's get to the third point and end this titanic shipwreck of a sermon. Number three, this is my last point. Focus what you say. Who's right? Who's wrong in this situation? I thought one was telling the truth and one was lying, but then I noticed a small detail in verse 32. Look at this. It says, and they spread amongst the Israelites a bad report. Did you catch that? A bad report. Not a false report. Not a wrong report. A bad report. That's right. We already talked about it. They put a negative spin on what they saw. Their doubt turned into unbelief. They were not trusting God's words to Moses in chapter 13, verse 2, when God said, the land which I am giving to the people of Israel. And for that, God judged them and the people who went with the majority report. Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 5 now. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. I lost my patient with the boys picking him up from school the other day. And instead of just saying the easy thing to say, I'm sorry. You know what I started saying to myself in the car? They're gonna grow up believing their dad's a hypocrite and they're gonna hate God and they're gonna hate church and they're gonna hate me. Crazy conclusions. Real simple situation, but we inject all these thoughts and we start saying things that contradict what God has spoken over our lives. I need to do something different. Yeah, I've got to deal with it. Yeah, I've got to address it and say sorry sometimes, but I need to declare over my life the truth of what God has spoken. I am a good husband. I am a good dad. Now this is about you, that you are always a good husband and a good dad. Well, maybe you are. But then you would be the exception to every other husband and dad in the audience. You see, this is why we need a savior for the times we aren't good husbands or good dads. For some of you, you're looking at a very real sickness, but that doesn't mean you can't declare the truth over your situation. I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. I am whole. I am redeemed. Yeah, you might have lost some years, but you can declare over your life that my God is a redeemer, that there is nothing too difficult for him, that my best days are ahead of me. You see, for those united to Jesus Christ by God's grace through faith, our best days are ahead of us. But those best days are not in this present evil world, folks. They are in the new heavens and the new earth after the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And sadly, I don't think that's what Jonathan means here. And this is why I think that. I believe that God is bringing you into something today. You're on the edge of a breakthrough. You're on the edge of a miracle. You're on the edge of a blessing. Don't lose your focus now. Now that's simply not true. Some in that audience are on the edge of real suffering and loss. It's just a matter of time. The real question from this text, Numbers 13, is who are you trusting in? Who are you really living for? You see, if you call yourself a Christian, is Jesus enough? If everything were to be taken away from you, your family, your home, your job, your health, or even your life, is Jesus enough? God's promise was enough for Caleb and Joshua, so much that they were willing to be in the minority and they could have cared less. Now the MO, the modus operandi of Elevation Church, is that after getting the crowd all whipped up, there is an altar call, which everyone, except the pastor, has their heads bowed and their eyes closed, 
are encouraged to surrender to Jesus so that the miracles might come true. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed at every location, if you just prayed that prayer, when I count to three, boldly shoot your hand up in the air. Do it courageously, man. We want to celebrate what God's done in your life. On three, one, two, three, shoot your hand up. Don't hesitate. Come on across all the locations. Let's celebrate the miracles of new beginnings in Jesus' name. Come on, lift your voices. Give God praise in this place. He's so faithful. His promise still stands. Now here's the thing, mega churches, especially with multi-sites, cater to people who seek to be entertained. These churches mistakenly believe that if they give the people what they want, they can sneak Jesus in through the back door and thus it's all good. But the trap is that whatever you use to get people in the door, you're going to have to keep giving them or they will wander off to the next big show in town. It's just like consumers abandoning their favorite shopping mall they've been going to for the past five years because a newer and bigger one just opened on the other side of town. These megachurches are expensive endeavors. Like I've said in the past, they are beasts which must be fed or they will die quickly. Which is why you will constantly hear about money and giving. And it's no coincidence that it happens during this particular sermon as well as the one I happen to use from Stephen Furtick. When we talk about giving in the church, how dare you with your thirsty self get an attitude, they just want my money. God doesn't need your money. God wants to be in your heart. He wants to set you free. You're the one thirsty. God speaks to you through his word and he says, I need you to start trusting me with the tithe. And remember, every time God gives you an instruction, it's not because he's trying to keep you from something. He's always trying to bring you into something. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. So he puts it on your heart. I need you to start trusting me with the tithe. And we go, yes, God, I got it. I'll do what you say. And then we start considering all these other things like, did I get the promotion I wanted? What were the bills like? Do I have all the shoes? What kind of vacation do we want to take this year? What kind of school do we want to put the kids in? And we start considering things that God never asked us to think about. And sadly, even at the end of Jonathan's sermon, there is this plea for money from Furtick. Hey, thanks for watching the Elevation Church YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this message, take a minute, click the subscribe button on your screen. That way you won't miss a single video. And if this ministry has impacted you and you'd like to partner with us to continue to reach others, you can click the link in the description below to give now. You know, one of the early church fathers, Jerome, once said, shun as you would the plague, a cleric who from being poor has become wealthy or who from being a nobody has become a celebrity. Stephen Furtick, uh, this, this is kind of a side note, but he built a little house a while back and he got some heat for it from the outside. And this is how he justified it. Well, me and Holly this year, we are uh, building a house. We've been looking for a piece of land to build a house for our family for a long time. So I'm like building this house and I'm real excited about it and everything. But then I found out, this is crazy. The news tried to fly this chopper over our house. The people that are building it told us, they're flying a chopper over your house. I'm thinking to myself, first of all, it's not that great of a house. I mean, I'm sure there's better houses if you just got to fly a chopper over somebody's house. But it started to mess with me a little bit. And then I started to get a little self-pity because I was like, God, now this ain't right because I didn't even build that house with money from the church. I built it with money from my books. And I gave money to the church from the books. And you start getting real defensive and being like, this ain't right, this ain't right. And then I thought about, you know, let's say I make it to heaven. Let's just assume that. Let's say I'm going to be there, skin of my teeth. Those who attend Elevation Church, I guess they don't seem to mind having a celebrity pastor who is wealthy because that's what they want to be. So that quote from Jerome when he says, shun as you would the plague a cleric who from being poor has become wealthy or who from being nobody has become a celebrity, apparently they disagree with that sentiment and do so at their own peril. This sermon from Jonathan should have echoed Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 10. Now I'll finish with verses 6 through 13. We read there, Now all these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Think of the golden calf incident. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. 
These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Here's those great lines that all of us should know so well as Christians. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way of escape so that you may endure it.